Hey family, I've been in this series titled When We Give. and We've been talking about what does it mean to give of your time? What does it mean to give of your talent? And what does it mean to give of your treasure? I think it's important for us to recognize that God is a giving God. I want to read this scripture right here and it says in James chapter 1 verse 17, whatever is good and perfect gift is coming down to us from God who is our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He he never changes or cast a shifting shadow. Recognize that the creator of the universe, the creator that made you, is if you are his child, you are part of his family. And being part of his family, just like you are a part of your father's, your earthly father, or earthly mother, you have their DNA in you. As the child of God, a follower of Christ, you have the DNA of God in you as well. God has placed it inside of mankind to be givers. God is a giving God. Remember, God gives, okay? So if you ever know someone that's a selfish person, or a person that's self-seeking, those people are usually not very happy. Their lives are usually filled with turmoil and struggle and hardship because they're going against the very DNA that's in them as a creation of God to give. Remember, God is a giving God. So we recognize that God wants us to give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. What is the time? Well, time means you're giving up of your time to serve others, to serve the people around you, serve your community, serve your family, serve in your church. You're actually giving time. You know, in our church, we have a lot of people that are giving time. They're volunteering their time to serve. And they're maybe serving people, but ultimately they're serving God. They're giving that time. And time is a precious commodity. I don't know if you recognize this, but you could steal someone's money. You could steal my money and I can get it again. You can ruin my reputation and talk about me and over time it'll come back again But the one thing that you can take from me that I'll never get back again is time Even as I'm w shooting this video and you're looking at me right now Let's just hope and pray that we don't waste each other's time because you'll never get today back again You know you think about people who live their lives and some people live lives for 40 50 60 70 80 and 90 years And they don't even make an impact a very small minuscule impact on the world they didn't make the best use of their time. I know children or even babies or even unborn babies that even though they were not even here on the earth to do a lot of things, even in their short window, they were able to make a lifelong impact in those around them with the time that they were given. What are you doing with the time that God is giving you? It is a gift from God and it is something that you'll never get back again. So I hope and pray that you will use it wisely talking about your treasure. What is it that you that matters the most to you? What is it that's precious to you? Recognize that God gives that to you. And when you recognize that, then you know that God gives it to you for a season, for a reason. So you don't have that treasure. Maybe that treasure is money, but for some of us, the treasure could be family. You only have that treasure for a season. You don't have them forever. And you only have it for a reason. What is the purpose that God gives you whatever it is in your heart that you treasure? But right now, we're gonna talk, talk about talent. Talent, and talent is not necessarily, um, you know, being able to sing or dance, but talent is your abilities. And everyone has something different that they can bring to the table. And God has given you talent and ability to do something for his kingdom, and he's given it to you for a purpose. And we must be good stewards with the talent that God has given us. Time, talent, and treasure. That talent thing is something important because God has given you tools that he hasn't given other people. So just want to set the foundation of this, okay? Recognize that you are not the owner of what God has given you. You are simply a manager. What does that mean? Well, I went to a grocery store and I saw the clerk there working, right? And there was a man there that was stealing from the grocery store and the clerk was watching the man. There was a manager there. I'm friends with the manager and he was watching the clerk as well. But what I didn't know was that in the office was the owner of the store. So the clerk kind of watched the man a little bit, but didn't really interact. The manager watched the man and was getting ready to interact, but everything changed when the owner came. Why? Because we knew that the owner was the boss of the boss. The manager was the boss, but the owner was the boss's boss. We are called to be managers of that which God has given to us. Good stewards, because we don't own it. I want to read this scripture to you. 
And this is in uh, Psalms chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let that sink in for a minute. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That means all the resources. That means the air. That means the birds. That means the creek behind me. That means that everything in it belongs to God. Even the dirt that we stand on belongs to God. Think of it this way. You don't own anything in this world. The Bible's very clear that it belongs to God. There's an illusion of ownership. But you can't take it with you when you die. Think about if those of us that own a house, say you own a house, or even if you rent, you don't own that rental property. And even the person that owns it, if you own a house and you've worked for 20, 30, 40 years, whatever time to pay off that house, you really don't own it. You have an illusion of ownership, but you don't really own it. If you want to test me on this, just say you own it outright and you have the deed in your hand. What happens if you don't pay the property tax on that property? What is the government going to do? They're going to take it from you eventually because you really don't own anything in this world. And God tells us right here in the book of Psalms that the earth belongs to the Lord and everything in it, the world and all of its people belong to him. Let that sink in a little bit there too. You belong to God. Matter of fact, you could say it right now with me. Say, I belong to God. I don't own anything. I am only a manager of what God has given me. Now, hopefully you said that and really can understand that. If you really understand that, then you understand the foundation of what we're talking about right now. We're talking about being a manager of the blessings that God has given us. And it says for verse two, for he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean's depth. You know, I think about this. What if Jesus were to return right now? We do believe that Jesus will return. What will he find? You know, what, what, what will he find? Will he find you using the gifts, the talent that God has given you, the abilities God has given you to further his purpose and his kingdom? Do you believe that Jesus is going to return? Do you believe that one day you're going to have to give an account for what God has given you to steward over? See, some of us, we live our lives with the talents that God has given us, and we live our lives like a reservoir. We often think reservoirs are great things, and they do have tools, but reservoirs are built to hold the resource. Your life was never meant to be a reservoir. Your life was meant to be a stream, just like behind me, this stream or a river. Your life was meant for the blessings of God to flow through you to the people in the world around you. That's what your talents are. And God has given you abilities, but sometimes we don't use them. The Bible says that Jesus is going to return. And when he returns, he's going to ask us a simple thing. I told you to go and make disciples of all nations. I told you to go and preach the gospel and to baptize and to do that. Did you do that? What did you do with the abilities that I've given you? And there's a scripture in the Bible, a passage in the Bible in Matthew chapter 25. If you turn in your Bibles, you can read that. And we're going to go over it really quick. Um, but if you kind of go a little bit before that in Matthew chapter 24, see, we want to understand the context of what Jesus was saying. And he's talking about his return. He's telling us what to expect during the end times, some of the signs and things to, to look for when we know his return is coming close. And, you know, he doesn't tell us exactly the day, but he tells us these are some things you can look that's happening around you to give you an idea on when I'm going to return. Remember, Jesus uh, lived and did ministry and lived for 33 years, powerful ministry he did in such a short time. But Jesus was crucified. He was buried for three days. He was buried. And then after those three days, he resurrected. After about 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And now he's telling his disciples when to expect him to return to the earth. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14. And this is a parable. And the parable is to help us understand 
a concept. He kind of breaks it down in a way that we can understand it. And he's talking about the kingdom of God. And when he's talking about the kingdom of God, he's using this parable of a king, which he's talking about himself. And he's talking about talents, which is actually uh, monikers of money. Okay. And these talents don't represent just money, but money is ability. Think about it. The more money you have, the more abilities you have to do different things that others that don't have it can't do. So he's talking about this, this servant, this king that gives his servants certain amounts of money, which are called talents. Okay. And so when we read this, we have to understand that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, I'm giving certain amounts to certain people to do certain things. And in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 20, 25, it says again, the kingdom of God can be illustrated by the story of a man who went on a long trip. Think about that. That's Jesus. When he ascended to heaven, he went on a long trip. Okay. And then it says right here, it says he called together his servants and other versions says slaves and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So if you think about that word entrusted, that's powerful because it's talking about uh, trusting someone with something. Have you ever entrusted someone with the keys to your car or the keys to your house, something that's precious to you? So he's saying that the king, this ruler, this master entrusted something very important to his servants, something of value to his servants. And then he said right here, he said in verse 15, he gave five bags of silver or talents to one and two bags of silver to another. And, and to the last, he gave one bag of silver to. Now the talents and these bags of silver, when you kind of break it down, it's about $1.4 million in today's financial abilities. So imagine if someone gave you one talent, which would have been about one to $2 million. So you think about that one servant that he gave me just one talent to, still had almost two million dollars if someone gave you that much money how would you feel what would you do with that money and they didn't just give it to you to squander it they actually gave it to you expecting you to do something with it something powerful something impactful with it I don't know about you, but for me, that would be a little intimidating if someone were to say, hey, here's $2 million or here's a million dollars. And I want you right now, Caesar, to take that money and I want you to double it. Or I want you to do some great things in the world. And I'm going to check on you to make sure that you're doing well with what I've entrusted you, that you're managing my money well. Well, this is what happened. And Jesus continues to tell this story. And the Bible says at the end of verse 15 that he gave it in proportion to the abilities that each servant had. I think it's important to stop there for a second and recognize that God gave, recognizes our abilities. He recognizes what we can and can't do. And he knows us more than we know us. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But he knows what we can and can't do. So he doesn't give every person exactly the same abilities or the amount of abilities as he may give the next. And then he reads a little bit further. It says in verse 16, the servant who received the five bags of silver, they began to invest. This is the person that got the most. They began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver went to work and earned two more. So they went to work, they hustled, okay? Then it said the servant who received the one bag of silver, here's what they did. They dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip. This is Paul's right there. Jesus has given an analogy and he's saying, in other words, I'm the master and I'm gonna return from heaven. You know, I don't know about you, but when he returns, I hope that he will find me working and doing what he told me to do before he left earth. And here's what he says right here. It says, the master called them to give an account of how they used the money. The servant who had, he entrusted the five bags of silver came forward and said, here, master, you gave me five bags to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Come. Let's celebrate together. You know, this right there, 
you know, you've been faithful. Sometimes we celebrate people's talent. We celebrate what they do and their achievements. But what God celebrates is faithfulness. So we have to recognize, even like in churches, we may say who has the biggest church or whatever. It's not about who has the biggest church. It's about who has a church with people who are faithful to God and his word. This is something that we have to really understand because, see, right here, the, the, the master, Jesus is making it clear that I'm not impressed with how good you look. I'm not impressed with what the world is impressed with. I'm impressed with faithfulness. Sometimes we want it to be elevated, right? And maybe you're in a place where you're at a job or you're in a workplace or even in, you know, in, in society and community where you want to be elevated. You want people to respect you. You want people to look up to you. You want to be the big shot. Well, just that simple desire reveals that you're not ready to be the big shot. God celebrates faithfulness. Right here, God says, you were faithful with the little bit I've given you. So because of that, I'm going to elevate you. I don't want to elevate myself. I want God to elevate me. I want God to put me in a place of authority or leadership that he wants me to be in and not really where I want to be in. Well, how does that happen? Well, if you think about that grocery store I was telling you about earlier, you know, you have that owner of the store and you have that manager right under them and then you have the clerk right under them. But who's under the clerk? It's usually the young person usually that goes and gets the shopping carts and puts them back and goes out in the parking lot in the heat and in the rain. Well, imagine if that young person says, one day I want to own a grocery store myself. Well, they have to build themselves up and, and build up the ladder of that. They got to be faithful putting the grocery carts back. They need to be that person that when the lady puts her groceries in her car, they can grab the cart from the lady before she even thinks about putting it back and say, ma'am, I got that. And even in the heat, in the hot 100 degree weather or in the cold winter or the rain, they're just out there hustling and working hard. And eventually the owner's going to recognize that. And the owner's going to say, hey, you know what? You've been doing that for a while. Come on inside and come be a clerk. And you get a pay raise. And you actually get to sit a little bit comfortably in a, inside the grocery store. You get those opportunities. Why? Because the owner recognizes how faithful you were in the small things. And eventually, if you're faithful as a clerk, you can be a manager. Faithful as a manager, you earn enough money. One day, you could probably buy your own store. This is how the kingdom of God works. And there's no shortcuts with this. So, verse 22, the servant who received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Come, let's celebrate together. And then you come down to the third servant or slave, right? And there's always somebody that's going to mess it up, right? And here's what the third one did. Verse 24, then the servant with the one bag of silver said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid that I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Wow. So this servant here, first of all, knew the master. They knew the character of the master. They knew what the master expected of them. They knew what the master ordered them to do. But they were disobedient. They didn't do anything. Why? What was their motive for not obeying and following the master's instructions? They were afraid. They were afraid. So they hid it. How many of you, how many of us sometimes we have gifts and abilities that God has given us? Maybe it's to speak, maybe it's to sing, maybe it's to dance, or maybe it's an ability that you have that you uh, can do accounting, you're good at math, you know, maybe it's an ability you have of organization, maybe it's the ability you have to listen to someone when they have a need or a concern, you know, there's, everyone has something different, but how many of us are afraid? So we sit on that talent, we sit on that ability, and we don't use it to further the kingdom of God. You know, that's a sad thing. Because the Bible is very clear that the master is going to come and take an account. There's going to be an audit that's going to happen. And the master is going to say, what did you do with the time, the talent, and the treasure that I entrusted you, that I gave you? Remember, in the very beginning of this video, we talked about this. We talked about we own nothing. We have an illusion of ownership. But really what we have is stewardship. And we're called to manage what God has given us because it belongs to him. 
You know, if you think about your ability to work a job, well, who gave you that ability? There are some people that don't even have the cognitive ability to hold a job. There's some people that don't have the physical ability to do the things that some of us do. But yet God has allowed us to have that ability for a purpose, for a reason. And we have to recognize that. And we come to that place of knowing that we don't own anything in this world. It's really God that owns everything, including us. Then the next question we come to is why? Why did he give us the talent and the ability? It's not for us to be comfortable. It's not for us to have an easy life. It's for us to further his kingdom. It's important for us to recognize that. It says right here, Master, I know, so here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked. Well, why did the master call his servant wicked? Well, because the servant was more focused on themselves. They were afraid. They were afraid of what other people were going to think. They were afraid of what could happen. Maybe you're afraid of what, what, what would happen if you fail. What would happen if God calls you to do something? He's not going to call you to fail. He doesn't call us to fail. No. He calls us to victory. When we fully trust him and we fully listen to him, he's going to call you to victory. So what is it in your life right now that God is calling you to do? He's not going to, he's not going to call you to do something that's going to cause you to fail. Okay. So he says, you're a wicked servant. You're more focused on yourself and your fear. You're more focused on comparing yourself to these other servants. Probably how many of us do that? We compare ourselves to other people. We compare ourselves to what other people are doing and how they're doing and how successful they look like. And you don't even know what that person's going through. They could be going through all kinds of secret stuff that you have no idea. But yet you're paralyzed because you're comparing yourself to a person that seems to be at this pinnacle in their life. And really, that's just an illusion. He says, you're a wicked and evil servant, lazy servant. You knew that I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why did you not at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. If you ever go to the bank, you know, nowadays, you know, you can have all kind of money in the savings account. And after a year, you get like a little interest payment, you know, $3, $4, whatever. I don't know, you know. It's really not a lot of interest. It's not like you would invest in the stock market. You know, it's really it's a minuscule amount of interest. But even the master said, if you would have just taken my money and this money I had given you, this talent ability and give it to someone else, they could have did better than what you did with it. You buried it in the dirt. You didn't even use it. You wasted it. Yeah. He says in verse 28, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use it well, what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have it in abundance. But to those who do nothing, even with what little they have, it will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Recognize this. If you compare yourself to what others have been blessed, you know, they got this much or they have this opportunities and I didn't have it. And you're so focused on other people, you're ignoring what God has given you. And even though it may be a little bit, it may not be as much as the person next to you. God has given you this ability, this talent for a purpose. And it can change the world if you allow God to use you. Recognize that God has a mission in this world. It's called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. And here's the thing is that God has called every one of his followers to fulfill that mission in their own ways. The mission is going to get accomplished with or without you. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't want his mission to be accomplished without me. I don't want his mission to be done without me being involved in what he called me to do. I don't want to miss out on what God is doing. I don't want to miss out on it. And I'm willing to use the gifts and talents and I'm willing to put my neck out there and I'm willing to risk it to be obedient to God. I'm willing to do that. And I'll tell you something, it's fruitful. You see fruit from it. And I'm not the most talented person and I'm not the best preacher and I'm not the best talker and I may not be the best looking man, but I'll tell you something, I'm gonna use every single thing. I may not be the wealthiest person, but I'm gonna use every single gift, talent and time and treasure that I, God has given me to further his kingdom. What talent has God given you? What abilities has God given you? Maybe you've been so focused on what other people's gifts and abilities are that you haven't really 
cultivated and worked on the ones that God has given you. There's three points I want to make to you. Number one, it's God that gives you the ability. And it's for a purpose. So remember that. Recognize that that purpose is to further his kingdom. So the talents in this parable, the story of Jesus talking, the talent, the, the, the monetary value actually represents ability. And not everyone has the same. And that comes to the second point. Every person has something different. First Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the different gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us to be able to further God's kingdom and advance his kingdom. You know, you have a certain piece to the puzzle. You have something to offer that no one else does. And imagine if you have a beautiful mosaic, a puzzle, and, and there's a piece missing. What if that piece is your piece? What about in your church? You know, there's, I believe that in, in my church that the, the abilities and, and the things that we need to get the job done, we have it right there in the church. Uh, often, we're often looking for other people and resourcing other people that were developed in other places. And I'm not I'm really against that. I think sometimes you need to do that. But sometimes people have just made that a, their default, part of their culture. And, and, and just to look for other people. There's other people, other people. Let me share something with you. If you're not cultivating the people around you, your team around you, if you're not doing that, you're all, all ultimately going to fail. You're going to fail. So work on you, work on growing you, and work on growing and finding the abilities and the gifts that God has placed you in the people around you. This is our most one of our most valuable resources God has given us is people with talents and abilities. So take the time that God has given you and use that time to develop the people in your family, in your church, in your Bible study group, at your workplace, wherever it is. Find their talents and abilities and help them recognize that so that they can help you and you can help them. And together and all together, we further the kingdom of God. Everybody wins. And the master is happy. Everyone has something different. So maybe it is, uh, you know, uh, being a handyman. Maybe, like I said earlier, listening. Maybe it's just helping. Maybe your ability is to help people, just to help stack chairs or help sweep something or, you know, do those kind of things. That is something that's important. Maybe your ability is to uh, uh, teaching. You know, teaching is a great ability and you can teach others and help develop them. Use that for the kingdom of God. Often we use our gifts and abilities and our talents to build ourselves, you know, and we could go out and dance and go dance and whatnot. Maybe in your church you could do like a praise dance with flags or something. Or sometimes, you know, you hear about singers that go out and they sing and they become these big multi-millionaires and all this stuff. But a lot of times they started in church singing for God and they traded that for the world. Don't be that way. Because in the end, you have to give an account for how you use the gift. I'd hate to be a person that, that sang in the world or rapped in the world and knowing that God had given me the ability in church and it was cultivated and developed and then at the, I become a millionaire and then I have to answer to God and God says, hey, what did you do with the talent I gave you? And I say, God, I, I made it a lot of people have a lot of fun. I hope and pray that, you know, you use those abilities to further the kingdom. And I can tell you often with the talent and abilities that you have, there's often a case that we can use that in church. <laughs> we can use it in church. Every talent and ability you use in the world, you can use that in the church. Yeah, to help further God's kingdom. So just think about that, you know, and recognize too that in verse 15 of the passage in Matthew, where Jesus talks about it, he says, he gives them the ability according to what they can handle. So God knows you more than you know you. So you may be in a place where you say, God, I can't handle this responsibility. Well, if God gave you that responsibility, you can handle it. Ask him to give you strength. He'll give you the strength to do it. He'll give you the abilities to do it. You may be intimidated. You may think you can't do it. And guess what? You can't on your own. You need God's power. But God knows you more than you know you. So the master gives the talent according to the ability. So that's why some people have more talent and ability than others. It doesn't mean that one is more important than the other. It just means that God knows what some can handle and what some can't handle. It's okay. You can handle it. Number three, last point. You have an obligation to use the talent God has given you responsibly. You can't give God excuses. And there's going to be an account that God is going to say, hey, what did you do? I've mentioned that over and over again. 
you're going to have to face Jesus. And you're going to have, Jesus is going to say, hey, I gave you an ability. I gave you the ability to do something. And uh, what did you do? And you know that when he asks you this, he knows the answer. He knows. What are you going to tell him? Are you going to be embarrassed by your inaction? By your reluctance? Are you going to tell him, Jesus, I was afraid? I was afraid of being poor, so I used the talent to build wealth instead of to further your kingdom? Are you going to say, Jesus, I was afraid of people laughing at me or failing, so I used the gifts and abilities that you've given me and I just sat on them? I didn't really use them at all? Or are you going to say, Jesus, I appreciate that you've given me time on this earth. I appreciate that you've given me the abilities. And I appreciate you've given me desires and wants. And what I want and desire more than anything else is to be obedient to you and follow you. So I used the time, Jesus, wisely that you gave me. And I used the talent wisely that you gave me. And I used it to further your purpose here on earth. And then Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I hope and pray that that's what you want to hear. You know, there's a scripture in John 2, chapter 2, 1 John, chapter 2, 28 and 29. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, not if, but when, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from shame. Yeah. Well, what does it mean to be full of courage? That means that when the master returns, we look forward to him. And we're approaching him with courage, knowing that we're in right standing with him and not shrink back from shame, being ashamed of the things we didn't do. It's important. God has given you a talent. He's given it to you on purpose. And he's given it to you for a purpose. Discover what it is cultivate it, grow it, and use it to further the kingdom of God. Hey, I know that God's giving you something. What is it? You can comment. Comment. What, what is talent and ability has God given you? Some, he may have given you more than just one, but everybody has at least one. What is it? I'd like to know. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and we're grateful, Lord, for your presence with us. We are grateful that you are a giving God. You gave breath and life to Adam and Eve. You gave a way out for Noah and the ark. You gave protection and guidance and rained manna from heaven, food from heaven for the Israelites. You gave your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. And when he resurrected and rose and then he ascended into heaven, you then gave the Holy Spirit, which gives us gifts. You are a giving God. And you give us today time on this earth, opportunities. You give us talent and abilities. And you give us treasure, valuable things. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, God, that we will be rivers and not reservoirs. That we will allow the gifts that you've given us because you are a giving God, giving God, that we will allow those things to flow through us and we will give to others and back unto you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.